this week, the Cogyard episode is supposed to be about adapting to things that don't quite go right. I could not have picked a better topic. Let me give you one quick example of just how this video shoot has gone this week. Oh my God. This week, the episode was supposed to be about the fan on the seat. Okay, now you see what I've been dealing with. What I'm gonna show you is an episode on foam craft and sign making and that, that kind of, you know, wanting to make things out of foam. You may not quite know how to do it. You have some really inexpensive tools you can get your hands on, the right ways to coat it before you paint it, before you, you, you know, whatever it is you gotta do. It's, there's a whole lot of content in here. But it was supposed to be about adapting. What I'd like you to do is take a journey with me through the adaptive video making that had to go on this week because it started with no audio or very bad audio for the first X number of minutes of this video. The audio recorder that I have with my beautiful lavalier microphones <laughs> didn't turn on. We start with no audio, but I'm gonna give you the intro to show you what the episode is about and then we're gonna go meta on it as we go through it. And I think you're gonna have some fun counting how many problems actually occur. So let's dig right in. Here it is. Today, I'm gonna to turn something like this into something to do with this. Yeah, we're gonna be doing some foam craft today and welcome. Hey, this is narrator Anthony because like I told you the sound wasn't on for this part but this is kind of important that you understand this you see I needed to make a replacement sign for a store that I had made a sign before the problem was I didn't have the piece that I needed to replace they changed the name of the sign however what I did have was my prototype of the sign from which I peeled off the ultimate sign piece that I needed to replace so what you're seeing me point to here is the template that I can then use to recreate the sign that we need to recreate. So here's where I'm cutting off that piece and not using my brain because the old sign was rectangular. The new sign has a very large oval shape right in the middle of it that extends up above and below the sign. So what I've just done here is basically screwed up the first time. Not counting the audio, of course, which I didn't know was a screw up. Yep, this is the spot right here where I looked at the sign and went, oh crap, I made a mistake, big oval shape. So now I grab the piece back, but of course now I have this really cool piece that is exactly the right shape. Well, at least it has the end dimensions correctly. So now I'm going to go ahead and get that set up. Uh, yeah, let's turn this around because there's something on the bottom of the other one, a D20 shape that I created in there. Now this is off and going to be the right size because this time I'm going to cut it right. I swear, I swear I'm going to cut it right. So I've just sketched this whole design out and I'm so proud of it. And I can't wait to make sure that you see it on the overhead camera. So I look up and see that the camera has turned itself off. So after crying in my beer and whining and moaning and realizing I still can't get it to turn back on, I'm just gonna keep working to trim down this piece, giving you lots of great action and adventure and dialogue and explanation of how this particular kind of box cutter is okay for this job, but I really do prefer the other one that has replaceable blades because it stays forever sharp. 
so I cut away a lot of the excess, get the whole thing sketched out. I'm really proud of it. But now I'm going to turn on that overhead camera and I'm going to make sure that it's running. And for the first time ever on this video anyway, you folks are going to get to see the actual overhead shot of what I'm working on. Congratulations to us. This is what I was sketching the whole time. And as you can see, it looks somewhat like what we're going after, enough that it is going to be reminiscent of the actual logo, which is all I'm really looking for. This is a 3D rendering, and so I don't really feel like I have to duplicate it exactly. I just need to get that same look and sort of impression of the actual logo. And now some of the magic begins to happen as I bring in the amazing cutting tool that we use for foam. This is kind of neat because it only costs about $20. It is a heating blade. It works kind of like a soldering iron, but it is long and thin, so it maintains a really high heat over the entire distance. What's cool about this is if you head off to, you know, Joann's or Michael's, they're about 20 bucks, but with their 40% off coupon, yeah, you can rank this thing in for about $12. And I'm going to show you some tricks you can do with it that make it well worth every penny. So now with a couple seconds of warming up, we can go ahead and get an idea of how well this thing cuts through. Now look closely. You can see the blade is bending as I'm pushing through because I haven't let it heat up all the way. And frankly, no matter where you're at temperature wise, it's going to bend if you try to go too fast. So we fast forward about 15 seconds. The blade is heated up very nicely. And now I'm able to make some nice, you know, quick cuts right through the foam. Of course, this is only half inch foam. If you're going through inch thick foam, you have more heat transferring off the blade. So you have to go even faster. The problem with this is there's no way of me making sure that I'm doing an actual 90 degree cut through the foam. So there is a tool that can do this, and I'm on screen describing it right now. It looks like a little table saw, the jigsaw that you'd buy, and they run anywhere from, you know, $95 up to as much as, you know, $700 for some of the really large ones. Well, I'm going to show you a way to take your $12 heat knife and turn it into one of these expensive table saws. Check this out. I made this using a couple elements I had on hand. This wooden block came from a shipping box that I think we got our dishwasher in a couple of years ago. Well, I looked at it. It was beautifully connected, wonderfully solid. So I just went ahead and trimmed it down to where it was the right size. Then I took a, a simple shelf bracket, chopped off the bottom, and attach that to the side. Next important piece is this little metal plate that you'll see here underneath my left hand in a second. That metal plate is covering a hole in the bottom, but I drilled a small hole in the metal plate directly beneath where the hole in the top bracket sits. Now what you'll see is that I will take the hot knife and insert it through the two holes. And what you will get is, it's really neat because there's actually a wide spot that makes it sit really snugly at the top. And you put it through the bottom hole and look at that. $12, $6 shelf bracket, and you now have the cutting knife and you didn't have to wait for it to be delivered. Of course, the reason for this is so that you have a nice large cutting surface and you can now take it and do some really, really careful cutting because maneuvering the styrofoam gives you a lot more control than trying to maneuver that little knife. And as you can see, you can hit curves exactly the way you want. You can move exactly the right pace. And because the blade is locked top and bottom, into the saw that you've built, what you don't get is any bending, warping, curving of the blade while you are trying to cut with it, 
which happened. You know, you saw that back at the beginning where the blade was bending because it wasn't able to push through. Well, that changes the angle of your cut and can give you something that isn't very attractive. But here we are, and now we have this kind of cutting going on, and it is so much faster, so much neater, and just better all the way around. Now I'm gonna go through, I'm gonna go ahead and speed up this next part for you so that you can see me cut through some of this stuff. There we go. Now that gives us a really clean, neat cut. And, you know, and, and this is the funny thing because I really was like, oh gee, how deep does this arm have to be in order to cut stuff? Well, because you can turn the stuff in any angle, you're not bound by the normal requirements of this kind of a jigsaw. Whoa, 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 hang on a minute. Did you hear that? That's my own voice. Ho <laughs> ho, the sound is now working again. Uh, the downside is, in order to match up the audio tracks, I really need the camera that I'm talking into to have its audio, and the camera one here, which is the main head-on shot, yeah, the audio never recorded on camera one, so what you're getting is pretty much my best guess, but you'll notice my voice is almost always perfectly lined up on camera two, because camera two actually has the voice on it so I can match up those audio waves. They're just very poor quality, especially since camera two sits right over the air conditioner. Uh, but you can see here where I'm able to cut through and do some really neat stuff. And I'm gonna get back to me narrating because I don't need to do this quite as much anymore. On to the sign from whence it came. Um, the next thing I have to do though, is I'm gonna turn this off and let it cool for a bit because now the other thing I did on the other sign, which I don't think I have any close-ups for you to look at that well, but I wanted this to look like it was carved. That was really, really the look I was going for. So making sure that um, it had that, you know, wood carved look to it, I really wondered how to do that. And it finally dawned on me that I had a wood carving tool. I've turned this off. I won't be using this anymore. But, you know, follow me for other incredibly useful, cheap tool making tips, because honestly, we're going to go through a lot of them. Maybe in some future episode, I'll show you how to make a lathe. <laughs> um, did that myself, too. Well, here's here's what I do. To make a cut. Remember, I said this was bendable. Well, you're going to want to bend it. You're going to create a nice little loop in it like that. This is made to be bent so that you can do fun stuff. I mean, I, I am going to continue to do this part here, hoping, beyond hope, that it will give me a nice straight line all around. I'm not, I'm not you know, cutting through the material at all. This is just a, uh, just a clean outline around the letters themselves. Now, if you really want to detail this thing well, then this is what you'll do. You'll go ahead and create this kind of a special outline around your letters. This is where it gets to be fun. This is where you get that carved look in the foam. And you do it by, surprise, surprise, carving the foam. So what you're going to do is you're going to start practicing digging out marks like this over the course in all the areas where you don't have the letters. You're going to have to go kind of slow because you're grabbing kind of a big piece. Okay. But as you go through here and you pull away from the edge of your letter, you will end up with what looks like wood that's been scraped back and you will beg me to 
to do a time lapse on this. And so, in answer to your prayers, here is your time lapse. So we just keep doing that until all of the... Hey, wait a minute. Do you notice what's wrong with this picture? Nothing. There's nothing wrong with this picture. No, there's something wrong with this sound again. Yes, the audio is gone again. Don't worry. It'll be back soon. All I'm doing here is continuing the carving process all the way along until it is done. I can assure you, you haven't missed very much. This has not been a very exciting uh, part of the craft. However, I did come across a couple tricks that I want to share with you um, before I finish up here. Uh, because whereas before, when I was trying to drag the blade to draw a fine line, like so, it kept skipping. And I was trying to do long straight lines with it. Well, that's when it dawned on me, long straight lines could be accomplished with the back of the blade, it acts like a skid now, and just slides right down across. You go slow enough, it'll get deep enough to actually do what you need it to do. And you see how those lines are just absolutely perfectly straight, giving me such nice control over it, that I just had to share that, because I thought somebody out there might want to draw straight lines. And I mean, I don't know why they would ever want to do that, but. You know, I know I want to do it, and so that's what I'm doing right now. Everything else from here over is all the same font, uh, but this one here has a much more ornate flair to it than even the cube. So I wanted to make sure that I captured as much of that ornateness, ornacity, ornatatiousness. I will let you answer in the comments below what you think the right word should be. Now, I am deviating from my own hand-drawn lines at times because, as usual, reality can differ from plans. We have to be able to adapt and adjust when that happens. So when I'm looking at this and I'm realizing this line may be too close or just physically speaking, it's going to cause a problem to try and carve that in the way I've drawn it. And then I go ahead and just adapt the drawing itself with new lines. Also important when you're cutting the foam, you keep in mind that just like wood carving, you want to sort of deal with the reality of the situation. You don't want to like carve in directions that couldn't be carved or you know, leave marks that just don't make sense. So a lot of these are long carves that look like, you know, somebody chiseled the wood out, which is technically what I'm doing. I'm chiseling out the base material, but instead of pounding with metal, I'm simply heating it away. I, I am in a really well ventilated area. Um, I actually have a very large air conditioner blowing straight at me right now so that it's it's probably cooling off my blade while I'm working, but uh, it really is something that you have to have in Florida. And so I turned it a little bit so that it's blowing directly at me, which keeps the fumes away from me, which is really important. One situation in which I was uh, turning a piece of uh, blackwood, I was making a, uh, a Harry Potter style wand for a friend, and as I was making it, everything about me started to burn. Uh, my hands, my face, my eyes, everything just started to burn. As it turns out, Blackwood, the kind I was working with, actually comes from a Brazilian pepper tree. So yeah, it was full of capsicum. And so as the sawdust was flying off, it was making what was basically pepper spray out of it. 
anywhere it touched my hands, the whole nine yards. That was an absolute nightmare. I can assure you um, when that, that you want to think twice about working with Blackwood because that is, uh, that is no fun. Uh, it, it filled the workshop. It was just ah, really, really not fun. Some of my edges here where I can. Not really so much concerned about these edges so, around the edge over here. You know, as okay, I, was saying, I will take some of those off a little bit. Um, so. That's the other thing is sanding things down is like super duper easy using you know just regular sandpaper. Even this stuff here might be too gritty. So what I'm going to do is take this around, give it a nice sort of rounded edge to it instead of the little bit of a jagged sort of thing we got going on as it as the blade dipsy doodled in and out and you can see here just getting this stuff done just a little bit just to give it just a little little bit more of a finished look and there we go. Now what I need is a way to clean. See, because one of the things you get is are, are the fibers. You get a lot of fibers when you're dealing with this. So one of the things I use, pardon me, to get rid of the fibers is something everybody I'm sure has laying around, and that is a horse brush. One of the joys of owning horses um, is that their brushes wear out. And so when they're done with them, they come to my workshop where they become absolutely fantastic for cleaning off your work area. Doop, 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 doop. Um, or in this case, getting all those fibers and little scrunchy pieces out of the woodwork. But this, this does, I, I found this out last time. This, this really works pretty darn well for getting most of it out of the, out of the surface because you see it as I get more and more out it becomes more and more looking like the sign it's supposed to be when it's done um, and so that is that's the beginning of this now what we're going to do is go ahead and mix up a batch of coating as I was saying, those who have worked, well, actually, I wasn't saying this. Uh, so those who work with foam know that it looks really good when you spray paint it until you spray paint it. In the uh, spray paint aerosol, there is a particular chemical that eats through the foam. And if you want to make your foam look very old, radioactive, you know, you've got something you really want it to look aged and decrepit. You don't want to bother going along and carefully carving in all those dents and dings. Then just hit it with a little of the spray paint and you'll watch it just vanish underneath. It literally eats the foam. So you can do things like that as a special effect. But when you've already done all of your finishing, that's the last thing you want to have happen. Um, a lot of people at this point will dig out the Mod Podge. And I like Mod Podge, uh, especially the one with the lacquer in it. There's like nine different kinds of Mod Podge. You don't need to get the one with glitter, um, unless you want to. The, the, the lacquer gives it a hard edge, a coating, so that it becomes handleable. It's much more durable uh, if it's going to be handled. This is an indoor sign. This sign is going up out of human reach. Therefore, we don't need to use Mod Podge. And so what we're going to do is we're going to fall back on one of my personal favorites, which is available for a lot less than Mod Podge and um, works just as well for the practical function of coating the foam surface. And that is, of course, any kind of white glue. This is available for $15 a gallon, roughly. Uh, and so it becomes an ideal, inexpensive medium for making that barrier. Uh, remember, I was talking to you about uh, using the 
uh, vinyl spackle as one option uh, for creating a smooth coating and so on. Well, this is another option that it, it doesn't fill in cracks or anything like that, but it's not really made to. This is going to give you a thin, even coating that will protect the foam when I go to use the next coating on it. Now, the next coating is something that a lot of people will apply directly to the foam because it does not have the same uh, ingredient in its aerosol propellant. So therefore, it does not eat the foam. So why aren't I using it? Because that's not actually true. I'm talking about uh, my second favorite coating, which will be going on after I'm done with this, and that is uh, Plastidip. Plastidip is a godsend for working on foam. It gives it a texture that just completely changes how your foam looks underneath your final paint. It also gives it a nice protective layer so that the, you know, and so an aerosol, if you are going to spray paint your sign, so an aerosol will not leak through. But what I found is that, as a little pro tip here, when you're working with Plastidip, if you turn the can the wrong way and you get too much propellant in the propellant to, you know, Plastidip ratio, there is still some of that chemical that eats the plastic in the Plastidip. It will, and I have had it eat my foam. Um, and it was really disappointing because I was going for a very finished edge and suddenly I saw the edge of the foam starting to just disappear. Now it's possible that what happened was they changed the formula on Plastidip over the years and it didn't used to do that, but now it does do that. Um, any way you look at it, it's not, a, uh, it's not a good thing for you and your foam to get into. They actually make a spray that you can spray on that will coat this that does not have it in the propellant and it's really great. I've got one can of it and it was discontinued at Joann's and I've never been able to find it again and I haven't wanted to open it. I've been saving it for that perfect project, <laughs> uh, which means it's probably gone bad now. You know, at least I know it exists. And so in my museum of things, I wish that were always available. It sits on a shelf. So I left for the night and uh, came back and it was beautifully dry. Everything looked fantastic. And of course, once again, the audio didn't come on. So we can either recolor this over to sepia tone and pretend it's a silent movie. Or I can just go ahead and give you a quick description that this is Plastidip. And it's going on beautifully, giving me a wonderful coat. You really only need one coat of this stuff. You just got to make sure it's, you know, very even and you've got all your spaces filled in. I love working with Plastidip and you'll see why in a bit. Now, one of the things that is important about the, the rest of this project is that... Um, we have eyes that have to be reproduced. Ooh, that was an awful sound. I am so sorry. I hope I can edit that out in post. <laughs> um, we need to do some eyes. Now, the eyes need to be black. Now, if you notice, those eyes are already black. So here's what I'm going to try as an experiment. Move this over a little bit further. We can get a little bit closer to on camera for this. So what I've got here are two pieces of tape. Masking tape, of course, does not stick at all to masking tape. So putting those two together can work perfectly. Because now what we're going to do is we're going to take an object that has roughly the same circumference 
that's not actually round, so I'm actually not going to use that one. Um, those are too small. Let me see. I think I got something here. I know. Here we go. The container that I mixed the... Uh, yeah, that should do. Now, watch this. What I'm going to do to make those beautiful eyes is as long as I keep these two on roughly the same center. Those are going to be too big. Let's go ahead and shrink it up a little bit. Hi, it's Editing Anthony. Now prepare for a whole new era where the overhead camera will come on, but only for four seconds at a time. Don't ask. Just four seconds. Don't ask. All right, now we've got those placed. Boom. Now we got it. Those look pretty good. Because now we have to do another coat of paint. So what we're going to be doing is, first thing we're going to do, I'm going to start with the silver because I have it out. We have the, um, the eyes taped off. And so, so what I want to do is give us just, actually, no, start with the gold. The reason I'm going to start with the gold is I think in terms of layers and what I'm going to be doing. And since I'm actually painting all of these letters gold, I'm also planning on mixing up extra gold paint for use on the brush. But what I don't, I didn't bring with me is my extra silver paint or gray paint. So that I don't have extra right now. So now what we're going to do is give these letters. Let's go ahead and record. But as you can see, we've now got and I wasn't sure how that was going to work, but that's actually going to give it a level of detail uh, that's going to make it look more like skin. That is something that is just going to be a massively awesome side effect of just having to have the right paint in hand. So a win for me on that one um, makes me very happy. Jump up, down, do that kind of thing. Want to make sure that camera is actually on. Right. This is kind of cool because what's happening is the texture is changing because I use this hammered gold paint. So what that is hopefully going to do is give us a kind of a skin effect look to it. So here we go. Now the job is to mix up the paints. So let me put the metallic colors over there, the flat colors over here. I've got red and brown. These are just basic tempera, you know, these are artist loft. Okay, um, but what I've got to do is I've got to mix up uh, several different colors in order to get the exact shades I want. Because I don't want to use just flat red. Where did I put those? There they are. Come here, you guys. All right. As you can see here, the one that needs the most mixing is, of course, the red. And we're going to start with the red in between the letters um, to get that one in place. So let's go ahead, get the dry paint kicked out, and let's go ahead and give us some red, and then mix it with some brown. A little bit more brown. Still a little too crimson for my taste. So that was actually a lot of brown. All right. So then, it's all about the painting. Start in a really big area so that you can get accustomed to how your brush is going to work.
get these eyes up and off. There's one. Making sure that they keep the, the main contrast of the golds. Because there is another way to do this. Make sure you're a lot closer. I might try it. It's because I ain't really picky about my golds. And I've got a big spot there. This is the gold. This is an empty container I brought down. Just in case this happens. Fill that with the exact same gold. It will not be quite as beautifully metallic, but it is at least the same shade. As soon as we let this dry for a bit, we're going to be ready for some kind of reveal. And won't that be exciting? <laughs> 